Hey everybody, thanks so much for swinging by Convention Out. In today's episode, we're going to talk with Lawrence LaPianta, the pitmaster and owner of Cherry Street Barbecue in Toronto, Ontario. Today's story isn't going to focus as much on Lawrence's current day-to-day, um, but much more so about how he got to where he is today um, and, and kept his, his wits and his, and his smile about him. What you're going to find in, in Lawrence's story is an ever-present willingness to, to pursue passions and to uh, be willing to go out on a limb, um, to take risks in pursuit of that passion. So I'm gonna let Lawrence tell his story because he does a much better job than myself and I think he has an incredible amount of wisdom to share. Thanks again for stopping by everybody. I hope you like it. Yeah, I got I got a screen here. I got I got audio. What? It's all set up. Yeah baby. You got Lawrence, some- this is Ryan. Ryan, this is my boy Lawrence. I'm How's it going? Lawrence, but a lot of other people I know call you Larry. Uh, no, well, yeah, I guess because maybe you know, it's just a handful, handful of way people. back. Yeah, yeah, I, we we go way back, we, way back. Um, like, like me and Perkins. I was gonna say, I'm not even gonna bother with the intro. We'll just get into it. I'll do the intro later. I introduced you guys. That's the point. Um, yeah. I got Lawrence Pianta here with me, uh, Cherry Street Barbecue in Toronto. Lawrence and I go, I don't know, back about 12, 14 years. Yeah. Total random happenstance. Just lived in a, a little corner of toronto called cabbage town where you tend to kind of like know your neighbors um and lawrence and i met back then and honestly it's uh a lot has happened since then a lot (laughs) a lot (laughs) um when i met lawrence he was he was in the film industry a shit ton of people here in toronto are in the film industry and after living here for a few years (laughs) yeah it's kind of a big industry but it was so new to me that like after meeting a couple people that were in the film, I just kind of stopped asking about the details. I didn't understand it. So. No, one, no one ever really describes what they do very well. It's just kind of like, yeah, because they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, well, it's a shit ton of work. It's uh, not that glamorous. And, and, it, and like, it, it ties in with what I'm doing here. Well, that's if, fair. If I told you how many people come in here and are like, man, I'm so happy you got out. And I'm like, out of what? Yeah. Out of making a lot of money? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like. Well, but you specifically, I do remember because you were kind of like, you weren't one of those dudes holding the boom, you know, no. you were, you were, I remember you being passionate about like your scouting and, you know, because what, what, technically what, what were you doing? I was a location scout. A location yeah, 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 that's all you did the whole time? Locations and management. So I would uh, basically find the place. So you work, you start with the director, you work with the director to find him what he needs. Yeah. And then you kind of build this world for the rest of the production to work inside of um and you deal with the public and you deal with the city and the permits and the insurance and all the rest of it and you kind of set everything up i worked a lot with americans right so i worked yeah. with a lot of la people a lot yeah. of new york people that's kind of where i cut my teeth and okay. that's how i learned how to do my job damn i didn't realize it was so much like yellow tape and stuff i always yeah. just thought of the sexy part where you like go and find this yeah, sweet go, scene and yeah, like it's that's so cool. it yeah no. <laughs> Yeah, go, go into someone's personal space yeah. and park 55 trucks or 100 trucks. So, and there's certain instances where you just need to do it because it's what the job needs. And, yeah. then and then there's times where you take that into consideration. You're like, I'm not going to go into this neighborhood because they get filmed in every weekend. And maybe I'll do my job and I'll go find, find another a place that works. Yeah, yeah. well, and it would like take you out of town for extended periods, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, it take, um, and I think on, on a whole, people would... Um, especially in lo- I can speak to the locations department, people get set in their ways and they always try to find the easiest way. Yeah. It's like people are like water. They always want to find the easiest path. Exactly. Um, <laughs> in- inevitably. If it um, works, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was, why, why, why change it? I, was, I, was, I, I 100%, I'm a nerd in everything I do. On my days off, I would go to Jeff Hill, grab a coffee, I'd go to the gym, and then I'd spend three to six hours just trying to find new places. Just wandering around. Just wandering around, going to talk to like people. Mainly always in and I wasn't getting, time? yeah, or okay. wherever. I wasn't okay. getting paid, but it's like, guess what happens when another job comes in? And, you know, knock on wood, I was like really lucky. I worked all the time. I live here in Atlanta and I identify with that because although I'm not, I'm not involved in the film industry from a profession, uh, I've done a decent amount of content creation for education and stuff like this, but it's crazy how many productions are here, not just in Atlanta, but in Georgia, 
and yeah. it's relatively frequent for them to shut down the city. I, I mean, Walking Dead, it's huge, right? It, I watch those credits roll. And I'm like, damn, Georgia. It's awesome. Oh, really? That's where they do a lot of it? Yeah. The Walking Dead in particular, and I'm not really familiar with the, the show, but they bought a city. The production company bought a city called Sonoya, Georgia. 20 minutes outside of Atlanta. What do you mean they bought a city? Just like it sounds. They bought a fucking city, bro. Yeah. Were there people in the city? There were. And over years of producing this show here, what they've done is they have... Uh, it, well, I mean, think about places like Detroit. Detroit yeah, I mean, where, there's a couple there's neighborhoods like, you, you can, you that could have been buy, bought up. You can buy entire blocks. Yeah. And and, and if a production company comes in, <laughs> excuse me, you got to think about if it costs them... I don't know, hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a week. It's cheaper to buy a city. It's than, cheaper to buy up the if you can afford to buy the real estate. Oh man. I've just never heard of that. that. I've never heard of that. I, I mean, don't know, is it good or is it bad? Like it's like all these kind of like it's kind of it's it's scary. Stuff, right? It's yeah. kind of scary because at some point the Walking Dead ends, right? Who yeah. keep, who's gonna take care of that city when they don't want to keep shooting? Yeah, they're there just anymore. like, oh we're good. We're, we're out. Okay. <laughs> it gets an but, abandoned but lot of that. A lot of point. these big shows, um, like you know, Sopranos, it's like you go into uh, Ho- like Hoboken, New Jersey, and stuff where like they that, sh- yeah, where yeah. they shot a lot of the episodes, and they 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 rented out buildings for so long that the landlords were kind of just like they didn't even weren't interested in the neighborhood or anything like that because they're just getting paid from the production. When I found out that I couldn't go to Boston and sit at Cheers, it's <laughs> fucking heartbreaking, bro. I, it's like a museum or something now, but it's just like. You know what? After uh, winning the championship last night, I I don't so out. I don't have a lot of uh, love loss for Boston. Oh, those no, guys have been on. A, I hate Boston. Those guys have been on a high for. But I would go to Boston. The better for part cheers. of my that's just how much life. I love cheers. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, for years I dreamed of making that track. What do you funny? Think, what do you think about Celtics, the Sox, the Patriots? Fuck them all. They're, they just they keep winning. The Bruins. Sorry, yeah, I, I don't know if they to just, our to our one viewer in that part of the or. or Listener in that yeah. part of the country, it's not personal. I'm just jealous. We're just you jealous. Just keep winning. We're all you just, just jealous. Keep winning. <laughs> like, damn. I feel like uh, the East Coast of America in general, where Boston is kind of the southern, getting to the southern tip, controls way too much of the society of the world. So anything that I think Boston's to- beautiful, but I've, I've been twice to party. It's very like. It's a great city. It's a it's a good food city, which makes sense. But it's a, it's a great city to go to. I mean, it's an educational epicenter. But man, when you start to talk about the Patriots, when you start to talk about the legacy of it, just it's we need to spread the love a little bit more. We'd be a little bit more diverse if we were a little bit more diverse. On <laughs> I agree. I agree. Like a like a token boy. Um, that was Hopefully a pretty that was a pretty beautiful. Tangent Thank you. Some it's Lawrence's you can passion for, for that industry because honestly, when when he starts talking about all the logistical aspects, that job sounds really shitty. I wouldn't want to do that job, but I never heard Lawrence talk about that side of it. He, well, every you, time I get, every time I was around you back then, it was just like like you loved your job. You become and, like a traffic cop. Yeah. You get yelled at all the time. And you're just like it's not good for relationships because people are like you're cold. I'm like I'm not cold. I'm just, I'm just listening. To yeah, you. I'm <laughs> listening. I'm just emotionless. Yeah, I, I, just, I can't. What did you want me to do? Jumping jacks? I'm just waiting for you to finish, and then I'll, I guess I'll respond. I had a I had a producer once from who didn't know me. I worked with them for the first time, and she was I think she's she out of L.A. And she was like with the production manager, and they it's funny because production people do this thing where it's kind of like they fire people on the first day of production. Just to set the just tone, like, oh, we're so lamb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. That PA has to get fired. I'm like, it's, and it's kind of like an old tour production thing. Okay. And so, anyway, so dead man walking. Yeah, I was yeah, on this job, yeah. and people kept getting fired. 25 minutes and finally, about Lawrence she went to the production manager and said, and he's still this passionate What's the deal with And I no. honestly... And After he's like, a couple okay, years of knowing once him, I don't know. That's it. Yeah, like, that's the last you, you got got And then like, uh, barbecue And he's like, one of my sisters ever heard. Like, yeah, I remember being like, yeah. yeah. And he's like, 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 whatever, who does it? What do you mean? And she's Lawrence like, well, he's like, well, no, it's, uh, it's a de facto, right? You're American. You must love barbecue. Yeah, that's probably why he wanted to talk to me. It's a great location in the hospital. He had a heart attack. Yeah. Like a point of pride or That's something. That's probably why you want it. So bizarre. Yeah. And, no, that makes and sense. And he's like, well, like I guess you, sound, you sound like you like barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Yeah. See yeah, Lawrence exactly. running? Well, in Canada, you just I mean, follow him. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, I mean, you don't I hear from I him. He's just really, doing his job. I hadn't it's thought beautiful. about it all that, that much, just, to be honest, because it wasn't like there was a bunch of good barbecue. I didn't taste I worked at FedEx. I worked at FedEx in university. 
<coughs> excuse me. And when um, one of my best friends to this day was a ramp manager at the airport, and yeah. he'd be like, and I'd be at my station on this side of town, and he's like, dude, so and so pilot brought in rendezvous, man, come down. I'm like, all Shut right, up. I do the run. So he that they, rare they, though. They would bring in stuff from from Memphis. I'm, I'm old, right? So it's like it's like uh, I worked at FedEx 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And you're you're and again, this is still when you this you're is again you know, barbecue shipped in. This is pre 911s, pre everything. Yeah, you yeah, to, it was you, a little you, different. You used to you know, get on a if you worked for FedEx, your flight benefits were you got on a plane, you could jump seat to anywhere the plane's going, and the planes always went to Memphis because that's where the hub was. Sure. So then from Memphis, you can catch another flight and go wherever you wanted. For barbecue, it's, like the, it's still, I mean, FedEx is still you're, an amazing company. So you're smuggling, you're smuggling brisket. No, the pilots are bringing in. The <laughs> pilots are bringing the in. Pilots are smuggling brisket. Yeah, I can't. You know, I no. It was, it was funny. They came from Memphis, so they brought in ribs and pork. So, oh, very yeah, I never specific. Ate, yeah. To be clear, only yeah. that. Yeah. Because I got my uh, barbecue education when I moved south. Yeah, Ryan and I go back. Like we know each other since college. So you guys, how long has Slow's been around? I don't know. I mean, it showed up. Like 20 years, 15 years. I, like I was going to say, I think it they're, showed they're, up though when I was in college. Institution. Like that wasn't around when I was in yeah. high school. Mm -hmm. but to be honest, I mean, Ryan, you've been to Slows before, right? Sure. You know that block. When we were in high school, there was a nothing on that block. Well, Tiger Stadium used to be in that neighborhood when we were kids, right? And then right around the time we were adults, like very young adults, they yeah. went from – Tiger Stadium to Comerica in that area, it's called Corktown, just fell apart. And yeah. Slows really was the only reason to go there for a long time. Have either of you been there recently? No, I haven't. Yeah, I, I not in a down. couple of years. I met the guys from, there's another barbecue place called Lockhart. Yep, Lockhart is there too. So that's all, that stuff is relatively new as far as restaurants. Oh, yeah, they're really good guys. I met them at a, at a convention, a barbecue convention. <laughs> well, that's no, that, no, that, that's a perfect segue. Yeah. It's literally, like I said, one night barbecue came out and Lawrence was just like, you know. I'll never forget. He really liked barbecue. Yeah. And I was just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, he wasn't talking about eating barbecue. Like, he was talking about, he was talking about it like a scientist and, yeah, I'm a nerd too. And this dude's getting into like, you know, the process of making barbecue, which again, as an eater, I never fully appreciated. And like, the more he gets into it, I'm like, shit, I'm into barbecue too. You know, <laughs> like he's like, he's just like oozing it. And literally, I, I mean, it wasn't that night, but within a week, you know, I'm in his backyard around and he's yeah. got this like, this I was like, doing, I was working on that little trigger at the time. Yeah, had, that's I, like I home barbecue. Yeah. And I, that, you said Traeger I at that think, time. I never even learned about Traeger until I moved to Hawaii. Yeah. Like, I didn't even know Traeger always huge, existed. Man. We call it smoke. So you were using a Traeger what? I had a, I had a, I had a Traeger in the backyard to do my – to work on kind of like rubs and sauces and – because it's like it's literally like an easy bake oven for barbecue guys. That's like you hit the button, it holds a temp. It's, it's wood pellets. It can make a backyard guy feel like a like a like a soldier. Like have it's they, like have they blown up recently? Oh, they've they've gotten massive. Is it recent? Massive, though, yeah. Or is it just because I'm in Hawaii and no, all these dudes? Are... No, it's it's just getting bigger. They're, okay. They've done a great job at marketing. Great job at okay. their ambassadors. I know a bunch of them. Uh, one of their ambassadors is Canadian uh, Danielle Divacu. She's a good friend of mine. Uh, she's like she does all their classes for them all through Europe. So they've been through. doing this for a long time. Oh yeah, absolutely. everyone's just finding out about it. Yeah, other absolutely. than you barbecue nerds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> other than other than the, the the hardcore nerd market. Well, you have to you have to share a little bit about like because like basically I didn't you realize tell you about it, but, my first brisket ever cooked and how bad it was. Well, no, seriously, <laughs> like because I didn't realize I don't know how to describe it other than like an apprenticeship, but it's like a home apprenticeship. Explain. What you were doing there is like logging hours, right? Like you weren't just cooking barbecue for buddies. Yeah, I was trying to, I, I got really deep into it. I was really passionate about it. I just, I loved it. And uh, and I tasted the stuff down south and they're coming up. And I had that kind of like uh, that uh, food memory, that taste memory of what, geez, of what barbecue can taste like and what it could be. And I don't get me wrong. I taste a lot of really bad barbecue. Yeah. I tasted a lot of really good barbecue. I think, I think, um, like everything, uh, now that it's uh, stuff like Food Network and stuff like that are great, it makes people care about food and where it comes from yep. and how it's made. Uh, and now, so you get a lot of people who have a lot more access to knowledge. The appreciation or, is or, much or, greater or, or now. And it's funny because I got the background. I, 
they see the TV version, so it's really glamorous. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I can do that. It's amazing. Um, there's no difference than the guys who I learned how to cook barbecue from and the amazing masters who have, like, a ton of mission stuff. You know, like, you know, the Thomas Kellers and all these guys. Yeah. Like, anyone who's come out of their kitchen hopefully has had been graced with the knowledge of or and the opportunity to be around someone who's great at what they do. Same with barbecue. I've yeah. had the opportunity to cook with and cook for uh, people who are exceptional. And it's funny because they're some of the most modest because they take it for granted. They're like, this, just, this is the way my daddy's daddy did it. Well, you say did it. And that's what I, I, I'm honing in on. It's like the talent, whatever. But all these badasses were always just hard, hard working, right? Like, there, there's a non You got to put in your time. The, the new school guys are very are, – are, is a is – smaller margin than the guys who've been doing in their families forever right so they um literally it's like legacy but yeah. i mean like yeah. it's passed out yeah like a guy like sam jones uh his family's been doing it for like 90 years you know wayne miller down in texas he's you know sam is just a whole hog cooker and that's all they've done his entire life since he was a little boy his grandfather and his dad and him and his uncles had had a restaurant and they cooked whole hogs Forever, you go in there for the, for the longest time. Their menu is chopped hog on a plate with coleslaw and cornbread, and there's or chopped hog <laughs> on a bun. <laughs> and there's a lineup. You and know there's what a lineup. You're getting, and it's, it's and people go there, and it's well. They got white bread too, Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, like one single slice of Wonder Bread. I'm gonna sop it up. I, yeah. I remember I stopped doing that on the plates here, and that's kind of how you evolve as a as a business owner. So that people would be like, every single piece of white bread would come back and make my. I'm like, people are starving in the streets, and I'm throwing away white bread. <laughs> I'm like, so I have it in the restaurant now. When people ask for it, and if you ask for it, I'm coming to your table because you y'all know what you're talking about. I like yeah. that. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, that's a like, little a little. I'm tip, like, they're like, eh? can I get white bread? I'm like, yes, sir. Yeah. If anyone says, hey, can I get? Do you have any white bread? I'm like, you can have whatever bread I have in this house for free because I love you. And now I'm going to come talk to you because you actually may or may not have eaten barbecue <laughs> at somewhere that's really important to me. Well, and you talk about it like, and I don't think people appreciate, I mean, everyone knows that a chef is different than a cook, right? We, a lot of people worked in a restaurant and like. It's, it's the brigade system, right? Like, it's just, it's just hierarchy. I get, weirded I, mean, out, I get weirdo when people call me chef. I'm like, no. Well, that's what I mean. I was going to say, like, do you. Because it's you leader, are you the head are of the kitchen. What is the label? A certified pit master? Like what? The, I'm not a certified anyone. I'm I, a I'm a donkey who's like, too dumb to know how hard he works. <laughs> <laughs> what's a pit master though? Like at some point Tree, for me, um, you got to know how to run a fire. You have to be a manipulator. There's like honestly, like I'm not hokey pokey into this stuff, but like there's water signs and fire signs. I'm 100 percent a fire sign. Really? Yeah, I hate the water. I get creeped up by the water. <laughs> put my hand in a fire a lot of times. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, I can tell that's not hot. It's just something. You you were built to work around fire. Yeah. I, I'm drawn to it. I love that. Always? Even as a kid? Always. Before you found barbecue, were you? Yeah. I'm lucky I didn't go to prison for being an arsonist. Okay. Man. You rearranged the campfire incessantly. Like, I loved fire. Yeah. <laughs> I, and it's not, like I said, it, it sounds hokey saying it, but I'm like, literally, it's true. I like those axes that you set, Larry. I like the axe between the the water guy and the fire guy. Um, I'm a little bit of like a yogi and an Ayurvedic person, and there are things called vata and pitta, which are like yeah. cool and hot. And I feel like if you were to set up some quadrants, Mikey is like going to disagree completely. No, I'm listening. I've never, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm interested. Yeah, you should look up Ayurvedic on your travels back from Toronto to Hawaii. Um, okay. But Ayurvedic science is basically kind of like Sanskrit, Eastern, Indian, Asian uh, religions slash medicine, probably medicine slash religion. So one of the things I want to I want to get into is his transition from basically being this backyard barbecue guy. Um, and I don't, I don't know, maybe maybe I was ignorant to it and people appreciate it or more knowledgeable about it than I realized. But I, I think most people just kind of think of barbecue as like, yeah, it just means they have a, a smoker or whatever, you know, but sure. there is like it's you put in your hours and there is like a technical level he's too humble to acknowledge it right but i i'm pretty sure a pitmaster is like a chef um and you can't just 
call yourself a pit master because you cook good barbecue. Like you, it's a rec, it's a recognized thing. Anyways, I want to get into his transition from basically like, cause I know when he first started doing barbecue, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't the boss. He was working, he partnered up with somebody, uh, uh, another friend of ours from Toronto, Paul Campbell, and they opened up a spot called Aft. But I know that was Lawrence's like transition from like just being that film guy. And, you know, he's, I think he was more doing fine, paying the bills, being the film guy. And he, he's at some point had to back away from that world to start to kind of do this barbecue stuff part time. I want to say that first year AFT was open, it was like definitely recognized as like best barbecue in the city. Um, wow. First year, like, and that was what AFT was about. Like people, people went to AFT, um, the barbecue, I mean, I ate and drank more than just the barbecue there by all means, but the barbecue was, it, it put it on the map. And it wasn't long after that, that basically I think Lawrence was like, all right, I got some uh, wind under my wings. I'm, I'm going to go fly and, and do my own thing now. Um, but he's now got a couple locations. Where are the locations, Mike? So Cherry Street is located in the Portlands, which is actually like a super kind of industrial, um, you know, defunct area of Toronto. And Cherry Street's the only reason to come into this neck of the woods. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if things kind of continue to pop up around here, but the original Cherry Street location is at Commissioners and Cherry Street, not surprisingly. And then he opened up one more recently in what's called Assembly Hall, which is on uh, 111 Richmond Street in Toronto. Food court, but like gourmet food court, you know? Um, I haven't been to that location yet. That happens here in Atlanta too uh, with the food court but high-end food court. I think yeah. it's because there's just a plethora of food vendors, guys like talent, man. There's talent, like yeah. There's you know you go to you go to a random pop-up, you know, and it's some up-and-coming chef or maybe mm -hmm. not even a chef yet, but it could be some of the best food you've ever had. You know, I just I miss that. You don't get that everywhere. You don't get that in Hawaii. You get some really good roasted pig, though, don't you? Oh man, forget about it, dude. Yeah. I'll be right back. What's happening? We're back from a break. Lawrence had a situation at the restaurant. And again, we are so grateful for him joining before the restaurant opened. So after you stepped away, Lawrence, I was telling Ryan, I'd, I'd love to talk about the kind of transition. Because I think for me, like I said, when I think about you and like the most inspiring part is at some point you walked away from a really solid gig and decided to follow your, I mean, there's no guarantees. No, I, I remember when you There's know, no Paul, guarantees right now. This day, well, that's no fair. That's fair. <laughs> but you, you know, you were paying the bills. That that wasn't that wasn't a problem. Oh, yeah, I was the cake maker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Make the cake. And I remember when when you and Paul were talking about aft. I remember just thinking like, that is audacious. Yeah. Cool. And Go I took for I took a I took a, a, a pretty much a year uh, unpaid leave. That was twenty thirteen. Um, no one had ever paid you to cook barbecue before that. No, though, I, never, I never. I never worked in a restaurant. I never spent any time in a kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you literally were just cooking in your backyard. And then I like did nine scientist. months. So, I did nine months, and I was like, "This is the hardest job I've ever done." I completely knew respect for. Like, I go to a restaurant. I don't think. I don't think the guy who put the plate down. I do. I no. purposely go by the kitchen to say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because it's a gnarly off. It don't matter how good it is. It's it's a hell of it, that environment is hell. I was probably misquoting, but within that first year at Aft, I mean, there the accolades came right away, right? Like, and I remember all of a sudden it was like, oh no, everyone in Toronto is into barbecue now. Yeah, even much to some of the other people's chagrin. It was I'm like, sure. It I was, don't. I don't know what else they're making here, but they should just make barbecue. And I was clearly. like, clearly, yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> oh, little old Lawrence. <laughs> Like, so many of us are carnivores. It, well, yeah. it's shocking, right? Well, and I don't think, like I said, I don't think the local market knew. I mean, I, I think that's why it resonated with me, though, because <laughs> barbecue, as long as you eat meat, barbecue is the only style of cuisine that brings everyone together. Yeah, I mean, some people don't like Italian. Some people don't like Indian. Some people don't like Thai. Some people don't like Chinese. You, I eat everything. You I, I've wood. been very fortunate. I've traveled <laughs> a, a lot of places. I'm very, very lucky, and I've had amazing food. But barbecue meat cooked on wood is private. Mm -hmm. 
if you eat meat, you eat it cooked on wood. Well, that's the best way to eat it. Like that's yeah. like it's intrinsic to like being human, like to walking upright. Oh, yeah. What separates us from like the Neanderthals? That's the big fire part. and cooking our food. <laughs> yep. We've That's, been doing it for a long time. We that, just keep getting further away from the most natural way to do yeah, it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Like, well, like I said, people. Lawrence, without getting you know emo on me here, um, <laughs> that jump. That's the scary part to yeah. everybody, right? Like stepping away, and you, so you had a little bit of financial comfort in that realm. I had a lot of financial comfort. Okay, I knew that I would build. On a quiet year, I'd build north of. So we build by the. I, in my department, I build by the day. Oh, okay. I, I was doing close to three hundred days a year. So you said I'm gonna I'm gonna start to follow my other passions. But like when yeah. you went into AF, were you like I'm done with film? It was started with uh, let's do barbecue once a week. Barbecue my first service, I was I thought I was gonna have. A, I had uh, I realized <laughs> later in life that I have uh, sometimes anyone can have a panic attack. Yeah, and I thought it was a heart attack. Because I'm like, these people are paying for my food. They're not my friends telling me, well, and smoke a mask saying how great it, it is. It all changed on that first service. I'm a pretty white guy. Like, I turned red in the sun. Like I'm, You I'm, were red and sweaty. I was, I, I was sweaty. Like, I felt so bad. And then I ate it, and I was like, I'll be back tomorrow, bud. Yeah. I don't know what you're worried about. You ain't eating it. I, I am. I, it's I, good. I, I thought, we turned the restaurant, like, uh, it was only 28 seats. Like, it was only inside. We opened in February. <laughs> Booming, man. And we did, and there was a lineup, and I'm like, there's people lined up to my food, there's people lined up to my food. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. What am I going to do? So when did you open this Cherry Street? 2016. How so there was after, when it, what was the first service at at? Uh, February 2013. It was I, that long. I'm a I rain man of dates. <laughs> I like that. Well, those are important dates. Those are. They, uh, were, they were very important dates. When you came into Cherry Street, I mean... I was looking for a place. So I did nine months at AFT, seven days a week uh, to get like the, so we went from one day a week to can we do barbecue all weekend to being uh, 60% of the menu was out of the, from the, from smoke was barbecue seven days a week. Not necessarily what you signed up for. Yeah. Um, I guess a good problem to have, but yeah, it's interesting. Oh, yeah, and it's that, a- that little thing snowballs into uh and then, so I had, I had, it's hard I, to feed that I, monster. I, already, I, had, I had the, I was in love with barbecue, but I, but where my real passion lied still was that I had already been uh, initiated or seen or been exposed to uh, true wood cooking. Real deal. Yeah. You, you were, you were getting a chance to do it, but you still weren't a hundred percent doing like, it the way you wanted to do it. Right. Yeah. Like I got the building, I got the lease. I was able to come in the building, uh, May 26th. Wow. We opened June 17th. Holy shit. That's three weeks. Yeah, that was, and I had been to uh, all my restaurant, all to my restaurant friends who I knew were like, uh, Lawrence, don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up over it. Yeah, it like, happens. it ain't gonna you, happen. You won't right? open in time. Yeah. And I'm like, and then I talk to my film friends, and they're like, three weeks? That's like three months for you, bro. You got it. That's hilarious. So it's an old bank building. So I filmed in here a bunch of times. You knew it that oh, well. Oh, I, 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 I'm oh, here. That's I'm here because of being yelled at by by the public for <laughs> years. So I understand that making things happen, you need to be in the right place. Yeah. Or go somewhere where you can do what you need to do. And I'm here because I burn wood 24 hours a day. And we're not super close to other stuff. So when you watch sports events and you see the skyline, that's pretty much the yeah. view from my patio. Yeah. It's like being in Red Hook okay. right? in Brooklyn in terms of like where you are in Manhattan, looking back at the, mm-hmm. like, it's a close landmass there to like Statue of Liberty. I'm like, we're a, a, a bit of a leg out yep. into the into the lake, into Lake Ontario that stares back at the city. So you get a sweet view and uh, some good barbecue. I want to eat the barbecue. <laughs> I'm not as interested in the nerding out of it. And like, that's, I think there's a really important thing to be appreciated there. Like, this dude's a, a crazy worker, and I don't know him to really care about anything without extreme passion. And, like, that's a gift um, to have that sort of passion, but to follow it is is pretty brave and ballsy. Um, because, like you said, there was, I mean, he still is claiming there's no guarantees. Um, he's got a pretty damn good thing going now. Um, but at the time, at the start, you're just coming with something you loved. You're we, sharing it with the world. We opened up in June. In my, like, first, my first January, I thought, um, I thought we were going to have to close. That first year. We had, so across the street from us used to be uh, Cirque du Soleil's, where Cirque du Soleil was set up. Yep. 
So we opened up with a bang. We had a great summer. 2016 summer was so hot. Our patio was was packed all the time. Yeah. Like we could have literally sold grilled cheese and done and that been okay. summer, right? It yeah. was just yeah. People were here and they didn't know who we were. They didn't understand what we were about. We're like, what do you mean I have to line up? But you just basically had a huge the Sucre de Soleil, like you had a huge massive. market, right? And then all of a sudden we have our HST tax, which we have to pay that we collect, but we don't. We buy unfinished products. There's no goods and services tax on it. Okay. But we collect it on behalf of the government. That's how HST works. Okay. So then you get this massive bill. From your sales, yeah. like uh, I had tens of thousands of dollars in taxes to pay, <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, I was like, what am I gonna do? And then we hit January, and they got all the statutory holiday pay, and you have all this stuff that's paying out. And I'm like, I don't. What did I do? Fuck. Yeah. What, I'm like, literally, what did I do? That part of, I mean, if if you can look back at that, like, did you just not really? appreciate that part of the business like I mean, yeah i just i just signed up to cook barbecue <laughs> i always say that all the time like I signed up to cook barbecue. ryan I, he gets a little bit upset when i tease him for using the word entrepreneur so much because i'm always like no, no 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 i'm not i mean you are by all <laughs> means but i'm just an employee um yeah but now i own my own company but i'm an employee of one i had five guys at some points that worked for me that were managers all at the same time but we all invoiced our on our own well now you right. got now you got now you got families now you yeah. got people depending on you and like that's yeah cooking barbecue in your backyard to uh that's heavy to pay in like in a couple years staff you still got that glimmer in your eyes Lawrence you haven't lost it huh? so um, 2016 he opens sounds like a you know a, a whirlwind of a year it was but gangbusters. mostly all, good all the all the all former film people were like. Man, you got out. It's so amazing. We're so proud of you. I'm like, got out of what? Yeah. I'm like, you make it sound like we had a bad situation. Well, but like you said, you were surrounded by a lot of people in that industry are pretty miserable, right? Yeah, and I don't I never really understood that because I was always like I would take a small break from work and because you because you work so much, it was great and we did really well by it. I could go. I've been to Hawaii three yeah, no, times. I remember and I've never been to travel. Minute, and I've been to uh, eight, I've been throughout Asia. And I've been throughout Europe, and I used to I used to make trips based on Mission Star restaurants. I would travel through Spain based on food, food specific tours. But yeah, and yeah. and it was amazing. And I just I love I had this passion about food in general. Do you? And then and then I I'd come back and I go back to work. And I'm like, guys, you need to you know people would complain about work or whatever we're doing or something like that. I'm like, why? In my head, I'm like, hey, you know, you don't even. You don't engage at work because you're at work. Yeah. It's like you don't have time unless you're outside casually. You don't talk to somebody about why they're always like negative. I used to uh, I used to work at a bigger engineering company. You know, it's like 50, 60 employees. Yeah. When I started, there was like a handful of us. And unfortunately, like with that growth became, yeah, like a, almost an ambiance of just everybody's so busy and oh, like under it all the time and I don't want I, to be, yeah. I used to always tell people like, Hey, how you doing, man? Like my thing is I've always told people live in the dream and people have always laughed at me. Like, well, I never really got why they're laughing at me because yeah, I guess they do think I'm, I'm fucking around. And then my, my retort, you know, cause usually I got a sarcastic laugh or something, you know, and I, I got to remind people sometimes like I used to work at a really nice company. We made good money. We had a job where we could always tell people and people would be impressed. Like if you're miserable, fucking do something else yeah. like you may not be living your dream but you're actually you never know how many other could, people's could dream life you're, you're living sure. <laughs> you know like change that shit up if you don't like it yeah you should never feel like you're it, uh, it's tough because we're not going to get it's not a psychology podcast that's we're not going to talk about why people end up in certain situations but you are the master of your own situation if something's not right or if you don't like what's happening you should change it in mo in like in work stuff. I'm not talking about like being in a really bad, you know, family situation where yeah. like, you know, but people, work have, stuff. people have this, but work stuff. If you're in an environment and it's not conducive to making you healthy and happy and you don't want to go there, you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Just, just make a change. I couldn't agree more, especially in a modern economy, right? Like, yeah. Those options. Those options. There really are. I'm always hiring. Like I've got a ton of staff and I still need more. And we're looking at a new location to open up. And if you are if you are passionate about food, not even barbecue, just food, you love food, you want to learn about different stuff, I'm going to hire you right now.
have some passions. Just be happy and yeah. like excited to work. Like I'll passions teach you everything. everything you need to know. Oh, right? like I don't like skill. We'll, some, we'll, we can develop. I've that. made I've made lots of mistakes in doing the, in doing our and you learn on the job. Yeah. The biggest mistake I've ever made, hands down, is hiring anyone who comes from another barbecue place in Toronto who says they know barbecue. They worked at a place that flipped a switch that has some kind of appliance that they call barbecue. Sure. I'm like, no, dude, I light a fire. Do you, I, go light the fire. They don't even know how to light a fire. I hate to say this, but like, there's a reason why I want to talk to Lawrence um, specifically. I know a few, you know, quite a few people who are in, you know, the, the restaurant industry and have had some quite a bit of success and as chefs and whatnot. But Lawrence is like the only one I know that's like kind of happy. All the other ones, like the more successful they are, they're like, they're just fucking miserable. Like I don't get it. I want to so ask you this: bitter. Is do you find that is that a Toronto thing or is it a, or is it no, a, or is it a global thing? I think thing? that's global. Like I, I don't know I think, any I think, chefs I think that are fun I, to I be think it's a, I think it's a Toronto thing where we always like. I just because I just did a, a talk to somebody about we wrote he wrote an article and I was like people are like well what do you think about this place and that place and I'm like. We spend way too much time comparing people on the negative yeah. than appreciating what we have yep. and elevating and appreciating what's available to us. Exactly. Oh, this place is better than this place. It's not this as is, good as I'm this. Like, there's, there's only, as far as I know, to this minute right now, there's three guys in the in the greater Toronto area. That's it. Cooking on wood. Really? Yeah. Everyone else is using like a gas cooker. Like Three people who are. Doing oh, I was going to say because barbecue is blown up here. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of spots, right? There's, yeah, you can buy a forty thousand dollar rationale oven, and you can put a smoker pot. You can put some chips in it, and you can make barbecue. Yeah, I just prefer it the hardest way and most la- and cost prohibitive to and labor intensive way possible. When I lived here, I'd go to St. Lawrence Market all the time, pay twenty seven dollars a pound for I yeah. uh, for sushi grade tuna, um, and I loved it. I ate it all the time. It was perfect. Ever since I lived in Hawaii and I catch tuna on occasion, I don't know if that I'll ever be able to eat it anywhere, anywhere else, else again. No. Now. Yeah, I'm like, that shit's two weeks old. I'm like, man, like, are yeah. you kidding me? It oh, it's been come. frozen. I'm like, oh, yeah. frozen too. Oh my god! Like, and, and yeah, it just spoils, <laughs> right? Like, exactly. I mean, he mem- he mentioned Memphis, and I know like he's such a foodie that he's toured all around the South and he's like, he's hit up all. And I've heard you speak of a couple mentors in the past. Like yeah. these are, these are your, I mean, your people I've been very, very fortunate to cook with. Who's like the mentors you speak of down in the States? Like, who? I mean, I, I mean, like, uh, so Billy Durney in New York is, uh, uh-huh. I'm doing amazing stuff. He's a new guy to barbecue, right? Like me, like I've been at it, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he's just, he's, been so passionate about everything he does and it's kind of like when you find other when you make connections with people it's because it's a shared connection it's usually because it's based on a passion you have or you're just passionate people it doesn't have to be food exactly art it could be whatever and it doesn't have to necessarily be lucrative it's just no, a no. shared oh no you if, love if, something if i wanted to get... be yeah if i wanted to be lucrative i would have stayed in film exactly well that's you know? like me and my buddy ryan it, there, there, there's nothing about this podcast that that motivated us other than like telling good stories being passionate yeah. and talking to people and which actually is i mean obviously there's always incentive to everything we're doing in 2013 like, when i opened that there was no money in it. there was no money in it i work people are like when you hear about people it's kitchen staff are some of the most underappreciated and underpaid people anywhere in north america wherever you go i mean these are like 2013 there's guys making 13 dollars an hour Twelve dollars an hour, and uh, and just crushing it, and working so hard, and they're doing it with a smile on their face. I, happy. I, I gotta make a note that I'm, you know, we're sitting over here in the corner. I got I got the pitmaster next to me. It's not noon yet, and there's a, I don't want to say a lineup for a negative connotation, but yeah, no, there's just people coming in from everywhere, and it's not noon yet, you know, like that's. Pretty good sign. I think they opened the doors an hour ago, and there's been people showing up and since and, they opened the doors. And I can tell by the way they're dressed, they're not from the neighborhood. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, yeah, there's a definitely a people, suits, and, suits and polo shirts aren't from this neighborhood. People got to ride over. <laughs> <laughs> I think what might be the commonality between the pieces there, because you talk about like, are all rest are are all restaurateurs pissed are all film film people dicks do all grips show up angry at the bar after work. I think the commonality is the backbone is a positive inflection on what the fuck you're doing. Right. And, And pardon my, 
my French there, but the reality is that it's it's not the work, it's the love. Yeah. And we define ourselves by the work, right? Because the work lets us buy the things we love and support the people we love and yeah, do those yeah. things. Yeah, it's a means, that's right, right? That's right. But, you know, I couldn't help but be nodding along so hard when you were talking about saying like, you know, if you're interested in food, talk to me. I, I, you know, I hire people. And I think that that translate across all regions where this podcast reaches is that if you're in love with something, go talk to the people who provide that something because you have to learn. You can't do it without a, a mentor. And you're always in, uh, in risk of getting a YouTube education, right? Where you're going to learn everything that you need. That's the worst. Well, other, other, other than Aaron Franklin, who put a, a master's class on on brisket, which I would pay for. Really? Yeah, I've met Aaron multiple times now, and and, and so what he like made a YouTube like he's on masterclass. You know those? Master oh class? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so he's got a masterclass on brisket. Oh. and I think if you want it, his book is one of one of if not the best barbecue books ever I've ever read. Aaron Franklin. Aaron Franklin. So all my barbecue books are, are most of them were gifted to me from the people who wrote them. I'm very, like I said, I'm very fortunate. The blessed. wonderful people who did them. I'm we'll make sure we put a link to that in the podcast notes uh, for you for that. I'm a masterclass user as well, and I speak <laughs> hugely of the validity of masterclass. It. It's a little right. bit expensive, right? So it's not like just free stuff. But I think, but I, it's it's funny because they they hook you, right? So it's like I don't know, 250 bucks to watch one, or 350 to watch all. Right of them. for a year. Have unlimited access. I want all of them. And I want to be a master at everything. I want to hear Sam, uh, Samuel Jackson talk about acting. Yeah. I'll never want to be an actor, but I want to listen to him talk yeah. about being an actor. That's perfect. Yeah, if you're going to listen. I took the Mike Judge one uh, about comedy and not that dissimilar from what we're talking about here is that Mike Judge talks about this like kind of meager beginning in comedy, like literally volunteering to go on stage. But the reality is, is that he quit doing what he was doing kind of at a little bit of an older age just to go do comedy. And a lot of people focus on eating ramen noodles while you're doing that, that, but the reality is that the payoff is different than the payoff of doing comedy for Mike judge, the payoff of, uh, of most people that talk back and do big things in the world and get a chance to observe upon it. It doesn't have to do with like chasing that income. The stories that end up well didn't start that way. Right. And, don't get me wrong, chasing that income. <coughs> sometimes it's really fruitful for a little bit, but no, but it's whatever motivates you exactly. and whatever you're passionate about. If you're passionable money, then go get it. Get it. it. Get go it. Go get yeah. It. But you know, don't work in a restaurant to get it. Like understand, yeah, yeah. like if you really like money, there's certain ways that you can make a lot of it. And you and, and, and you, you make it see, seem sinister almost. You well, can do no, it, you can do you can do it legitimately. Cool. It's cool. No, yeah, <laughs> go no, get it. Get it. Get it. But don't study, yeah. you know. Okay, don't become a teacher. You know, like don't no. study engineering. Don't become a like, teacher if you like the lifestyle, you like making a difference. If you like kids and you like teaching, yeah. then become a teacher. But if you want, if you're really into money, don't become a teacher. Yep. Like that's not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. <laughs> if you're really into money, you listen to this. Question yourself about what it is about money that you're really into, because it might really just be the wind that you're into. It might really just be the uh, the the feeling that you get after you cash that check. It's probably not what you buy from the money. The per the passion of the pursuit of it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, I had a poster in my room up on a wall, and it was like of a it was like a graphic of a, a really nice house with a five car garage overlooking like the ocean. Like it was probably like a Miami kind of thing. Yeah. And there was like a, a Testarossa. There was like a Lamborghini. Can I, can then I all say these, the quote? Was, it, yes. I had the same We'll post. say it together. Justification, Justification for, for higher, higher education. education. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me, bro? I had that same post. You know what? You know what? Right now, I couldn't give a shit if I have it for Justification for higher education. That is, you got to find that a picture of that I, poster. I, yeah, <laughs> We've established it's not about the money. We established it's about the love. We've established it's about the barbecue, right? And, and all of those things, I get the impression that that's a, a bit about you, which you do need to put you first. Talk to me and tell us about when you realized that what you were doing was making a difference in somebody else in your life, whether that be an employee or somebody that is a, a frequent guest at your restaurant or something like that. Because I Again, I've only met you 40 minutes ago, but the reality is that I think the impacts that you probably remember are the impacts that you watch happen either on your community or on those people around you after you take care of you. I guess the, the positivity or the feedback or the, the selfish part of this is, is putting smiles on faces. 
the amount the amount of people who who are like, man, this is like, thank you so much. This is delicious. This is amazing. Like, it's yeah. not about the remuneration is different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what you remember. Yeah, because you know, like literally, come in my restaurant in February on a Tuesday when there's four feet of snow, and I got a full dining room. It's the only people in, in, in anywhere that are all smiling and happy. True. <laughs> you know, at that time of year, right. you know, the city is fucking and, miserable. And, and, that, and I like that to literally. I like I try to teach everybody with Southern hospitality. It's just real. It's real. People come in and say hello. People leave say thank you. You think it's a given, but it's not. It's not a given, and it's not everywhere. Ryan lives down, you know, he mentioned he lives in Atlanta and lives in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real thing. Um, But it doesn't exist everywhere, and unfortunately, if you grow up around it uh, and then you leave that, you'll find the rest of the world to be a little bit colder. I think my perception is different because I was a consumer for so long. I was the customer. Yeah. And I remember what made me happy. That's my wife calling me. I have to call her back. Um, and, and and literally, it's like I remember like walking to places and I had a very good friend here who's passed away and uh, he had a restaurant downtown Toronto and he was from Memphis and he was a professional athlete, opened a restaurant. And I remember going there <laughs> and he had one of, so this is tying in with the whole Raptor story now. It's uh, kind of ironic. Uh, athlete from the States comes up here, calls Toronto home. And he hugged every guest. That's incredible. Yeah. How are you not going to enjoy that experience? We didn't have, so prior to basketball, we didn't have much of an urban black culture. No. And definitely, definitely we have a Caribbean culture. Yeah, I was going to say more of an immigrant. We, we don't have a, 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 a black history like uh, the United States no. does, where it's like many, many years. So he's a, 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 a black former athlete, now restaurant owner, having a place in Toronto and he basically gave all of the professional, especially basketball players at the time, yeah. somewhere to go. Nothing stereotypical. Yeah. It was a fine dining restaurant that catered to those individuals who had, didn't have anywhere to identify in Toronto. That's incredible. Yeah. But it gave, because it is, and I hate to say it, but like, I don't think people understand all the time that when it comes to athletes playing in Toronto, it's not, it's not always a real desirable destination, no, you know, because they're like, uh, other I don't than, know anybody up there. Yeah. Canada. I've never even been to Canada. <laughs> you know what and, I mean? And, like, and it's funny. Cause it was just like, you know, you're that was pre Drake, but yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. That did change. Some and shit. that's why, you know, it's, and that, I was sorry, tying like, you know, sorry, keep tying everything. In. I love it. That's so go, going goal. back to the Drake thing. It's like being unappreciated. It's like, a bunch of Toronto people are like, oh my god, it's so embarrassing. He's being like he's such a, like he's literally just being passionate. And I was he's I was at, I was at Coach, I was, there, I was like, at Coachella four years ago. Yeah. And I'm a I'm I'm sitting there and I'm like, I like Drake's music and yeah. I, I appreciate everything he's done. Uh, but I'm sitting there. I'm like, so I, my highlight of the weekend didn't happen to be Sunday night when he was playing. Okay. But I'm sitting there and I'm getting I'm like getting choked up because a bunch of Americans who've never fucking been north of the border are are singing to running through the six i grew up i, I was listening. east coast yeah you weren't listening to any brooklyn's, Canadian. brooklyn's been in my heart since yeah. i was a kid you didn't grow up listening uh, to you know, canadian rappers though you yeah. know there weren't any no I mean. no and and you just uh, ra- well, i'm talking like you know early 80s you know and then you take it back it was, it was in coachella and all these fans are singing running through the six i'm like what's my home yeah no that's special it's and it's funny because it's similar i mean when eminem blew up that shit was crazy, right? Yeah, like exactly. all of a sudden, everyone and uh, you know, unfortunately, there's Detroit was super cool. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> at least people cared. At least people were talking about it, right? And we knew, like, Jesus, you can't go to where that neighborhood. Yeah, you, you can't. All those places he's talking about, no, you can't. But at that time, I remember, I you know, I'd be out of town. And people would be like, do you know do you know where Eminem lives? And like, that's how it, living in Hawaii, right? When people find out we're from Toronto, they're like, do you Did know you, Drake? Yeah, do you know Drake? I'm like, what? yeah, yeah, he lived right down the street. It's I really know where he's building city. his new house. I'll take you by later. Nice, you. Yeah. nice. What, Casa, Casa Loma or what? No. He's, <laughs> Pretty well, much. I won't say it, but he's, he's probably he's looking like him. that, I bet. Um, I he lives close to a very good friend of mine, or he's building his home close to very, another good friend of mine. So. I think we're... At this point, we're occupying seats that could be for paying customers. Um, and I know we, you know, we've we've covered a, a a range of things today, so I think we can wrap it up. Um, 
I cannot. Let's do it again. Yeah, man. <laughs> Lawrence, I can't thank you. But enough, let's do it out man. in the pit. Yeah, let's it'll get nice and hot. Nice no, yeah, he wants to, he wants to get me in there and see who falls over first. I feel like uh, he's I'm a must be ice. He's so water. I'm, yeah, I'm he's water. 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 Clearly, I don't want nothing to do with it. <laughs> no question, Lawrence. No question. I would like to have some film on that in the pit, and I really appreciate you taking some time today. I, I know our listeners can hear the busy restaurant increasing in the background as the lunch uh, hour nears here, and. Um, it really is impressive to have you share your story. I'm sure that we will cross ways. Uh, and I'll holler in a couple months and we'll, we'll do it all over again. Well, and I think by being selective of our guests, what we've done is try to create this long form content that is a little bit less about what your mainstay is, right? So barbecue is your mainstay and everybody could find you. You're at Cherry Street Barbecue in Toronto. They can Google, they can see you on other podcasts talking about the way that you cook and you, even your first brisket. I watched earlier yesterday, finding receipts from your first brisket. But reality is what our show is about is much different. And it's about talking about like the experiences that get you there. Uh, there are a lot of how I built this podcast, and certainly some of this will show that. But I, I couldn't thank you more, man. I really appreciate it. I look forward to coming to your restaurant. I make my way through Toronto uh, every other year or so. So, All right, brother. We'll talk Take soon. Take care of yourselves. We'll talk. Bye-bye.